Welcome back, fellow jazz bums. Today we have Florian Arbenz here. Um, we are super excited to talk with oh. him. Uh, before we get into it, uh, remember to like and subscribe. Come hang out with us on the Jazz Bums Discord. We'll link that below. And we live stream every Friday, so you can come check us out there as well. And with that, I'm going to kick it over to Felipe to get us started. Today, we're very excited to have Florian Arbenz, drum and percussionist from Basel, Switzerland. Um, very well known for his work with the trio Bane, along with his brother Michael. For the past several years, he's been releasing great records with many different musicians, especially a great collaboration long time with Greg Osby, American, also uh, uh, with um, Sextet Convergence from 2020. Since 2021, COVID isolation has been working on a series called Conversations, which we're going to explore more. Uh, and he's just put together a new Sextet, which is starting to tour. The series wrapped up. He has more stuff coming out. And uh, we're Delighted here to have you, Florian. Thank you so much for joining. We want to talk about thank you for all these exciting projects, past and future. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks again, Florian, for joining us. Um, the first question I have is we like to talk about like your musical beginnings, like maybe in your childhood, even and like what kind of music your parents listened to, what your influences may have been, and then kind of how you got into jazz music. Yeah, I'm a Quite a typical uh, musician's kid. <laughs> my parents were both musicians. My uh, I have a twin brother, so we grew up in a very musical environment, and um, there were like instruments all over our place. Um, we had a small apartment packed with stuff, and so it from beginning was kind of the same for us to to play music and to play with toys it was <laughs> kind of the same uh, situation and of course we were aware that we had to take care of the instruments and and uh, shouldn't break them but our parents really left us a lot of space with that and i think this is lasting until today this uh, very curious adventurous and playful character um music has for for me for myself what um were there any uh particular instruments that you gravitated towards um when you were young or did you have kind of a a few different um instruments that you like to play uh you know my father was a piano player and uh, my mother was a cello player and uh, i started uh, really liking the piano as a, as a kid and but in my heart i always was a drummer so <laughs> i always was fascinated by by the drums and uh, uh, yeah, I later played also the clarinet and the saxophone, but the uh, drums was always my, yeah, where I got most excited, like, um, uh, first of all, as a kid, also, like, seeing a drum kit was uh, already exciting <laughs> for me, yeah. being, like, the colors, yeah. and, I mean, it's just, uh, yeah, it's just a great, great thing, your drum kit, you know, even to look at, and uh, so, even when I was, like, uh, uh, surrounded by other instruments and also got in touch with a lot of classical uh, music by my parents. I always was uh, excited by drums. Hmm. Um, so did, did they play in an orchestra, your parents? Uh, no. Um, yeah, my mother did more like chamber music stuff. But, I mean, they were really kind of uh, uh, open-minded, but also very classical trained like like my father's favorite was like schumann and and of course bach and brahms and, and i i grew up with this kind of uh, very uh, classical environment but they had a small jazz collection uh, mostly stuff like louis armstrong stefan Caffelli, john reinhardt those kind of ella fitzgerald and um when i was like four years old I discovered this collection with my brother, and I remember that the music, uh, I still remember the recording, it was like a, this, uh, it was called the es Esquire concert, mm. and I think Jam Session, which is the Esquire magazine was putting together uh, for poll winners, mm -hmm. I don't know if this is a kind of known, but it's, it was just part of a collection we had, and it featured like, like Louis Armstrong, Roy Eldridge, uh, uh, Lionel Hampton, all those great musicians, Sick Catlett on drums. And when I first heard it, it just blew me away, basically. I, I knew that I 
fell in love with this music. Was it like, it, like this? Oh, this was, yeah. I, I mean, it was a collection, but it could be, yeah. So it's this like was a, the, uh, an American uh, issue of it. it. It's a Norman Granz produced production for Clef. Maybe, yeah. yeah. Well, but it's got so a lot of the same players on it, so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, Red Norvo was playing the saxophone and stuff. So I, I was really, mm -hmm. it freaked me out completely. <laughs> yeah. And I loved that's it what, from I love that so. record. Yeah, 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 yeah. So you have it too, you see. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, so great. that was a great start for me. So since then, I'm uh, addicted to this music. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Um, well, that that's very cool. So um, I guess. Uh, w so when did you get your own drum set? Because um, I I yeah, took drum lessons as a kid, and that was a really big kind of moment where I had like an old kind of beat up drum set, and then I finally was able to upgrade and i got you know something more substantial but um what so what age did you start kind of taking drums very seriously and then how uh yeah how did you kind of get your first kit yeah i i think i i started very early but my teacher was i mean maybe at four years but my teacher again uh, in the music school he was a jazz freak and later he feeded me with a lot of great recordings like the mingus and also more advanced stuff, George Russell and, and uh, uh, Lester Bowie and those cats. So oh. he was a big inspiration for me, but he was also a very uh, classical trained teacher. So I really had to start with the snare drum and I, I never uh, okay. even could touch the drums. So <laughs> it was re really a uh, rudiments first kind of thing. Yeah. And um, as we were living in a in a small apartment, I, it wasn't uh, possible to have a drums drum set there. So yeah. um, I remember myself putting all kind of stuff together. And after five minutes, our neighbors came and said, "Sorry, it's too loud. <laughs> we can't take it." So uh, my first drums, I got them with maybe fourteen years. Um, okay. And I think like everything or a lot of stuff in, in the or things I had to go through in jazz music was about my own uh, initiative so I had to take care of it so I had to to look for a room I had to I was asking a drum teacher from school if I could put the set the kids there in in the room and she agreed and so I was fixing up everything so with 14 I finally got my my own kit and it was of course a great thing for me to have at yeah. the end yeah yeah, I uh, I was watching videos of you earlier, and you have a lot of different percussion instruments on your kit, and uh, it's just it's really fun to watch you play. Um, it's very entertaining. Okay, great, thank you. Yeah, yeah. yeah I, I later had classical training because uh, in the in the city in Basel where I was living, uh, there was not really a jazz school going on in this time. I mean, it was just the start of the. What became now a quite a known uh, jazz campus where they have a lot of also American great stars teaching there. But this was just the beginning. And um, uh, I got like hooked up with a great teacher uh, on the conservatory. So I, yeah, I started to, to have full classical studies there. Um, and I also played a lot of orchestra stuff and contemporary music. And yeah, that's maybe where. I I found all these funny noises and, and sounds and mm. very, I developed my curiosity for that. Yeah. So you you went to these schools. Did you go to like uni university as well for like music or was it the conservatory or was it like high school and? and no, college? I I mean I was uh, divided kind of in two parts, <laughs> but now I think I take an advantage out of that. Um, like my education was really purely classical. Music. My teacher was uh, in the university. I made the whole program until the performance master. And uh, but on the same time, I, I had a, there was a bass player uh, in our city, and he was uh, kind of uh, putting up um, sessions with us. And he was the bass player of the Kurt Leitze trio. Oh, nice. And so I got in touch with, with Leitze uh, very early, like as a teenager, and uh, also with uh, Pamotu Domoye, uh, the great mm. drummer from the Art Ensemble of Chicago. And they hung out a lot in Basel. So wow. I had kind That's of amazing. two educations at the same time, like the classical uh, university education, but also the kind of street <laughs> education mm -hmm. from Leitze and from Moye. And uh, 
I also started to perform quite a bit with Leipzig um, from between 18 years and 30 years. Uh, so um, yeah, there were some, uh, besides the, the classical education, there were some big father figures for me uh, hanging out in Basel. So that's, that was my luck, I guess. Oh, that's incredible. Yeah, a uh, check. You 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 had a, a big influence, right? On uh, Cuban percussion, Cuban music, uh, Caribbean. How, how, how did that come about for you? Yeah, I mean, yes, that's right. There, there's on one side there is this uh, really American jazz uh, roots. I, I I really feel very much connected to. Uh, later, uh, when 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 I was like. 22 years old when we started to hook up with uh, Greg Osby and uh, so I really had this kind of, of American roots I had later with Dave Liebman and, and uh, actually the last recording I did just now was with Ron Carter so it was kind of a really big big uh, thing happening for me yeah but on the other side uh, when I was studying in, in Basel the classical uh, percussion there was a a composer and he was really kind of an open-minded guy and she hung out in Havana and found a, a student uh, com for composing which he wanted to bring to Basel so hmm. I just met him you know just randomly and he said oh do you want to go to Cuba and it was it was winter and snowing and <laughs> I was here yeah, why not let's go so they put me basically in the next plane to to uh, be able to do this exchange and I was I really fell down in a completely different world there for about eight, eight months I was staying there mm -hmm. and uh, yeah the start was a bit rough because I didn't talk uh, Spanish and uh, I didn't really find out how it worked uh, the whole society and the whole thing <laughs> but mm -hmm. then I started to to hook up with people from the folkloric scene and I, I started hang out in the streets and, and going to all the religious uh, religious party you can say where they play the drums okay. and everything yeah like a festival so, thing? yeah no it's more yeah. more like uh, uh like uh, rituals you would okay say, no? mm -hmm. like yeah, yeah, and, yeah. And, and like the folkloric stuff where people meet it's very african influenced i would say and not mm -hmm. doesn't have to do so much with the cuban salsa it's more a street scene but i really fell in love with that that so I kept going back uh, for year after year, and uh, yes, people say that it can be heard now in my playing, but oh, <laughs> but I think so. Yes, it's so somehow it's shining through a bit. Yeah, that's true. How would you say the class? You know, your classical training influences your, you know, maybe composing or just your your jazz playing. Um, you know, there was a time where where I felt a bit sorry that i didn't do like really proper jazz studies at the jazz school and going through all this kind of uh, process but i think now i i mean my teacher was very much into sound so i think uh, this is something which probably connects with the uh, drummers like max max roach for example which play very melodically and uh, I think which nowadays it's not so much in fashion anymore. So, uh, yeah, I feel connected there with, with the old cats somehow. Oh. And I think also like having a, a feeling for a form, for an overall construction of a, of a tune or a piece of music now helps me a lot to be a, a leader from the drum chair because I can't really influence the melodies or the the harmonies or whatever i just can write it down and then all the people have to play it but i what i can influence a lot is the energy and the construction of the the overall tune so i think this is something uh, which i i could uh, really uh, take over from the classical world to the to the improvised music somehow when when you say um uh like max roach's uh melodic playing are you referencing like his M Boom stuff, where it's uh, more like a percussion ensemble, or do you mean no, earlier? Just uh, the all the regular okay. quartet he had with Clifford Brown okay. and okay, just his listening to oh. his solos. Uh, I mean, it's, or also there is like oh, I can't really remember the recording, but there is one 
really great solo. He's just playing basically groove, but but uh, playing around with all those uh, uh, yeah musical patterns of of. Mm -hmm. He was almost like a composer to me. Like his his playing is is not. I mean, he's playing drums, but he's also playing is almost composed tunes, and I find this really fascinating with him. And also being a great leader, of course. I mean, yeah, yeah. I was just getting into amazing. um. Uh, he was kind of a co-founder of an early label called Debut, um, mm -hmm. and they put, out, they put out like twenty record, like twenty records back in like. Okay. The, early 50s mm -hmm. but even then you could see he, like he was taking a leadership role with helping you know like create that label and produce those records mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that early that early on and then you know obviously his his uh quintet with um clifford brown is just incredible mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah he's... Yes. sorry no no i just just want to say and also like the stuff like a boom and and all this as he was just kind of a really visionary person Agreed. Yeah. And uh, beside of being a great drummer and musician, he was just like a, a master of uh, just uh, create creating something somehow. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Have you heard? Um, this kind of reminded me. There's a the record on JMI we all like called Black Dynamite by Mike Mitchell. Have you heard that record yet? No, Florian? no, no. I have to check it out. No. Don't yeah, he's a drummer. He's amazing. It's a it's a two LP solo drum record. Okay. Right? And, okay. And, and speaking of melody and stuff, right? Like when I we 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 were blessed to be sent copies of this record by JMI, and when I first saw it, I was like, "How do you make a like a eighty minute solo drum record that someone wants to actually listen to?" Right? I was like, my brain was like, mm -hmm. "That's gonna be just like, mm -hmm. is it just a bunch of drum solos?" But it's not. It's like mm -hmm. melodic and, mm -hmm. and and just amazing. So I totally recommend you you listen to that. But that's please, you know the you talk about with Mike Roach. Um, you know, or my maybe send, send me a link after you. I really well, want to hear sure. that. Yeah, yeah, really well, interesting. Well, for sure. I felt I felt that way about. I listened to a bunch of your music this morning from the conversations, various conversation records, and I, I got that vibe from from your music too. That you're, you know, not just keeping time back there. You know what I mean? Like you have something to say, and I've really enjoyed the stuff I listened to Thank this you. morning. It's great. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's. I mean, it's a very personal thing at the end. But I always liked musicians which which can use uh, music as a as a medium to to uh, express mm -hmm. something which is more than just uh, playing patterns or technique or whatever. So mm -hmm. so Absolutely. if if it reflects uh, mm -hmm. whatever it is, personality or thoughts or philosophy or whatever, it's it's getting interesting. I think. Yeah, one, one thing I noticed, um, you always seem to be playing, even like your trio with Vane, always like kind of bringing guests, adding different different ideas and different paths to, to the songs, you know. That's quite an interesting thing. And regarding, so Vane was your, your very first big, uh, great, uh, you know, more popular band, or how, how did you get into Vane? How did that happen? Actually, uh, it started before because I always was like mm -hmm. playing with, with my brother Michael, who plays the piano, and um, we had uh, a trio when we were like teenagers, and with, with an older bass player, and uh, yeah, our first kind of bigger steps we did with this trio. It was called the New Jazz Trio, and <laughs> it actually didn't last so long. Not because uh, of the quality of the music, but the, unfortunately, the bass player got really sick, uh, mm. so we couldn't go on with it. But we did our very first tour with Greg Osby in 1998, yeah, long time ago, mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, with uh, with this trio. And uh, yeah, after that, this bass player got sick, and uh, so uh, there was like time between where we checked all the bass players, and then we found Thomas, and then this finally led to to Wayne and to also I think a more personal uh, voice on the on the trio music mm -hmm. um but regarding the guests we just always loved also to be inspired by uh, other people i mean the trio can be very small <laughs> also yeah, yeah. also socially you know and uh i mean yes we, we we had like guests we we knew from the time before like like uh 
Greg Osby or also a Glenn Ferris, the great trombone player. Uh, but then I think that maybe the best thing we did was to invite Dave Liebman uh, to be as a, a guest with us, and we really had developed a very close relationship with him. And so I when was, a guy, yeah. I was just going to say, when a guy like yeah. Dave Liebman comes into the the group. How does his style, um, like, how do you how do you balance like his his, his like style in, into the group? And um, do you do you kind of um, kind of provide him a platform to to kind of uh, lead in some ways, or is it just more of a group effort? Like, how how does that kind of work when you kind of immerse a new musician into the trio? Yeah, I think it it uh, depends a lot of the personality. Uh, mm -hmm. of, the, of the soloist or of the guest. I mean, like Osby, for example, he's a very modest, laid-back person on the stage. So he he always gives you a lot of space just from his nature. I mean, his his behavior is very uh, modest and easygoing. And Dave is more or less the opposite. <laughs> he's a very uh, <laughs> strong guy and a very uh, inspiring guy and uh, i mean all, also very tense you could say like uh you know you know him you know he's <laughs> exactly. i know and, he's uh, sure, yeah That's uh, yeah i mean yeah i mean and so we we had to take much more effort as a trio that he just doesn't take over the sheep but just say oh, right. how it works, you know <laughs> so, yeah. Oh, yeah. but <laughs> after a while um i mean Luckily, um, my brother Michael, he's really into heavy chords and heavy, like, uh, mm. uh, also like um, maybe more unusual stuff he took out of, of classical music. And I think this was probably the moment where Dave also found out that it can be very interesting to collaborate with us because we bring in a new vibe he maybe didn't really, or he wasn't aware of before. And I think this was the moment where the ice was broken and we were very much interested in his history as a player with Miles, Neville Jones and all this kind of mm -hmm. big history he brought in. And he was maybe uh, inspired by our unusual roots we brought into the group. And I think mm -hmm. at the end, it was a really nice and exciting mixture. Mm -hmm. So, but probably nice. with, with other people, it would have been completely different so yeah it sounds fun yeah and uh, yeah it's an adventure <laughs> that's a great thing yeah, about it, you know? <laughs> oh for sure for sure and uh are you guys in a, in a hiatus now or are you planning to, to play back again in the future what, what, what's the current status of things uh the current status to say is uh unfortunately a standby Status because uh, my brother is leading the jazz department in in, in Lucerne in other city in Switzerland and Thomas is sick of traveling oh. and we did it uh, um, since 2006 so uh, yeah. yeah we feel like it's time to take a break um, mm -hmm. yeah it's a long story and an exciting story um, yes but as I said before the trio combination can be very you can be very close to almost as a as a marriage and sometimes mm -hmm. i saw those guys more than my own wife so <laughs> so um yes um let's see yes and we you know also you develop kind of a certain style with the group and the certain uh, ideas about music and uh, yeah we we just feel right now that this it's all more or less said what we wanted to explore within this room so uh, instead of just going on and producing boring music <laughs> we decided mm -hmm. to to stop for a while and then see what what's what's happening yeah yeah so it's very interesting i mean i like that you said you all said what you had to say in that format which is cool um that makes a lot of sense to me instead of like you said instead of just dr dragging on and just putting out records to put out records you know when you're listening to jazz records, you can tell that sometimes, right? Like you can tell when people are just going through the motions sometimes. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. And yeah. You know, I, so I appreciate that y'all have that kind of, you know, thought uh, with your music yeah. that you don't want to go down that path. Um, you, you toured a lot with Vane. You tour a lot with, you know, all these, all these groups. How is, 
how is how is jazz in Europe health wise? Like, is it? Do you feel like there's a really robust um, jazz scene in Europe still? Because there, I mean, in in America, it's there's lots of young artists, which is great, but we don't hear that much about about them, right? Like, we have to find them, um, you know, and it's just not mainstream in, in, in any way, right? I, I would guess mm -hmm. that like less than five percent of people in this country listen to jazz ever. You know, mm -hmm. so how is it in Europe? I think, um, like music wise, it's a very interesting time. I think it's, uh, I mean, Europe is so small, kind of. And, and, uh, I mean, talking about Switzerland, we have like this very small countries of uh, seven million people, like four different languages. And, uh, all the, those parts, like the German part is more connected with Germany and the French speaking part is more connected with France. So Italian speaking part more with Italy. So there is a lot of exchange and, uh, there, yeah, for example, in Switzerland, there's, there's a lot of, uh, there is not a certain style like the Scandinavian jazz. You, 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 you say it's more kind of ambient wise or uh, with a lot of reverb, but <laughs> a lot mm -hmm. of space. Uh, it's more kind of uh, each group is very different, and I really like that. So, there's, for example, uh, uh, quite known singer Elina Tuni. She does more like Albanian-oriented music, and and then there is like another singer, Andreas Schauer. He's more in the improvised scene, and then I'm doing more like international collaborations, yeah. and then I mean there's just a lot of stuff going on. And on the, on the same time, there are a lot of centers like Berlin it has a more kind of a abstract music scene. And Paris has, of course, the whole history with the American musicians and, and also the history with the MPs musicians. So you have a big scene mm -hmm. for traditional musicians, a big scene for this all of MPs oriented stuff. So I think it's interesting. And on the other hand, what do you say? Yes, uh, you have to fight for your audience and for your mm -hmm. gigs. So it's not, it's not easy. I mean, mm -hmm. uh, I mean, now I'm just going on the road with, with Osby next week and we have like 12 gigs and this is already kind of a big, not big tour, but this is al mm -hmm. already an achievement to yeah. play 12 gigs in 12 days is already very good. <laughs> and I mean, mm -hmm. like 20 years ago, this was just like, a little tour. <laughs> yeah, right, right. So of course yeah. it's uh it's changing. Um yeah, I mean let's see how it will develop in the next years and mm -hmm. how curious the audience will stay. Uh, yeah, right. I do just a quick follow up on that. I do feel like we're in a special time for jazz though. Like with the new artists we're 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 hearing and listening to you, this the, the conversation record you're putting out. I do feel that there's, there's like a it's this is an interesting moment right now, if that makes sense. Yes, I think so. Yes, and in any direction, I think there is. I mean, I think it's a, probably a more difficult moment for the American jazz musicians coming over to Europe because Europe used to be kind of a safe place for those guys, and also money-wise, economic-wise, a safe place. And uh, I think after COVID, it's changed quite a bit that uh, it's less money around so there are some uh, oh. festivals and producers which were focusing on American musicians which, which now focus on on uh, European musicians and then you have the whole discussion with the gender and the female musicians and but it makes it of course it makes it interesting I think so too I, mm -hmm. I wouldn't want to see of it um, as a bad time just because it's changing you know Right. Right. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Yeah. It, it seems like a change religion to me. Um, you just mentioned COVID and uh, something that we, we hear a lot from artists as well. People had to be sitting down for two years, pretty much. And that kind of pushed them to, to write, to, to do more. Do, mm -hmm. And there are so many records being released now and last this year crazy. from, yeah. from, from yeah. those days. And that's how even your project conversation started. So I think this is also like a, a period of pause for people to work more on compositions and uh, perhaps is, is a new, is a great time now for new things, you know, compositions, mm -hmm. definitely, new yeah. musician, everything, right? A lot of large ensembles too in, in Europe. 
like 12 piece orchestras, 15 piece orchestras. So um, yeah, a lot of, you can feel that people were writing music somehow. Mm -hmm. I think so yeah. too, yeah. Um, was... And on on the other hand, it's it's just difficult to take projects like this on the road, right? It's I mean, yeah. move all this the gear and all the people. It's kind of a, yeah. Let's see how this will work out at the end. Yeah. Yeah. How how was that experience for you in terms of when things got locked down? Uh, I'm sure gigs got cancelled, and you kind of had to find exactly nobody really knew what was 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 happening. Um, and then also just in terms of like practicing your instrument and like, how were you able to kind of adjust coming, going into the, the lockdown? And then when you did um, start collaborating, you were, was there any kind of like remote um, collaboration? Like, were you sending files to people to build on or was it all done together in, in a room? What was the process? Um, yes. I mean, I'm, let's say I'm a, I'm an active person and I'm a positive thinking person. <laughs> so I, I never was uh, sitting at home being depressed uh, during the COVID <laughs> time because that's, it's just not my nature. And I always also just was exploring possibilities to connect with uh, musicians. And also I'm a very analog person about music is uh, concerned mm -hmm. I mean, just I just really like to be on the same in the same room than than other people and to interact uh, in the analog and very direct way and uh, I mean I found out very quickly that that um, it was still possible for people to come into Switzerland for professional reasons and um, so I could invite all those musicians and just write them or just employ them basically for two or three days and uh, the first musicians i started with the first uh, conversation they live in paris um so it's basically three hours train to switzerland so it was really kind of cheap and easy to bring mm -hmm. those people over for a start Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so after that, I mean, I, I, I went on with some Swiss musicians and after that, I just, when I really was sure that I wanted to do the whole series, I, I, I yeah, I started to think what's next. And then that's when, where the whole process <laughs> kind of yeah. started. Um, but I mean, within Europe, it was always a uh, possible kind of to, to travel. Uh, with this kind of employment situation and uh, of course on the other hand the musicians were also sitting at home on board so almost all of them were really happy that I asked them for the project because they didn't have <laughs> anything to do and for example like people like François Moutin uh, which is usually a really uh, busy musician busy bass player um, he was sitting in Paris and was bored, so this was all. Uh, this was also the good and the lucky side of the whole situation that that all those people were happy that that somebody was setting up something, and mm -hmm. uh, so it was in, in overall a very positive uh, vibe and a very positive um, thing. Of course, a lot of work and to, to organize all the financial aspect was yeah. was kind of a nightmare, but uh, yeah. like the creative process was really uh positive i think Very and cool. we uh, this was also kind of the concept of the whole series and um, to make it work with one rehearsal in the evening and two days recording so that was what i did with all all of those recordings just oh wow i sent sent this course in advance and then uh yeah they came in uh, in the afternoon we did a rehearsal at night and then two days recording and that's, that was it basically so these, mm -hmm. these are the conversation recordings. Um, currently, I think I, I think number 12, th this is the final one, number 12? Yeah, 11, 12. Yeah, right. Yeah, okay. that's right. Okay, so um, mm -hmm. you can check out all these on the Bandcamp. All of these are LPs in addition to CDs and, and digital. Right, um, yeah. And, you know, they obviously form a certain aesthetic just visually. I think they look fantastic. And what's really cool is... There's this conversation box set that's I think it's pretty limited, but you can get all yeah. the titles in uh, you know in this nice box for um, you know for 200 euros. 
Um, and I think this edition of 50, so that's limited to 50 um, boxes. Golden is golden. First serve, first skip. Yeah. <laughs> that's right. So we'll, yeah. we'll, link, we'll link to all this um, in the description if anybody wants to check it out. But um, highly recommend, so, if anything, just to go stream some of these. They're really great. Mm -hmm. So, Florian, in this process, when you started, you had this vision, okay, 12 records, I'm going to make them. Did you have already, like, established who you wanted to work with? Or was that something that was happening? You had the idea, okay, let me call this guy, so let me write this type of music now. What was your approach? Was just, like, things coming or, you know, you had it all laid out yes. from the beginning? I mean, the, no, definitely not. I mean, there was the start was kind of obvious because I, I was uh, the first um, recording I did with uh, Nelson Veras and the, the Herman Mahari, who is from Kansas City, but lives in Paris now. This was just kind of an obvious choice because both lived in Paris and they could come over with the train very easily. So the start was kind of obvious. And the, the next one I did was uh, Jim Hart. He is from London, but he lives like in the in the, on, on the other side of the French border, so he could come over with the car. So this was kind of the first steps where, uh, yeah, you didn't know what was possible and the borders were closed and everything was kind of closed. So uh, this was just uh, the musicians I had around me, basically. But then, um, yeah, after a while, I mean, I, there were people like, like Osby or like, um, Kurt Leitze, which I really wanted to collaborate with, and, and Leitze in this moment was 84 years old, so it was also kind of a, a chance to get him over and to record and to reunite with a, a guy which was so important in my musical life. And on the other side, there were people which I already wanted to call I wanted to co collaborate for a long time, but they never had time. Like Tineke Postma, for example, she's so busy. <laughs> so uh, I just was catching her in a good moment, more or less. And um, on the other hand, on the, on the third hand, there were also like musicians I discovered by uh, yeah recommendation or by checking out or by having a, a specific idea. And I think now in the, in the latest recording, the, the London guys, uh, Ivo Neem and the, the trumpet player Percy Perslov, for me, they are really outstanding, very personal musicians, which I didn't know, know before. I just discovered them uh, with the time. And um, also after a couple of recordings, I had to think, oh, well, in which uh, direction I wanted to, to go with the whole project. And it was also a challenge for me not to to have to have the same style of recording yeah. just twice. And yeah. people mm -hmm. just say, oh, we already heard this. It's, yeah. you know, so uh, I had to to explore a bit the, the music world and my own thoughts and my own uh, yeah, uh, uh, music. I had just to yeah look and for interesting stuff. So. Did That's you know? This, guys. Did you know you were going to do twelve from the beginning? Yes, because uh, the word conversation has twelve letters. So okay. if you see the oh, letters on, okay. the, on the covers, it's basically <laughs> the the word. It's oh, like right. a C, uh, O, N. So uh, yeah, oh. that's the. Very uh, good. Yeah, oh, I feel that's, stupid. Uh, I didn't realize yeah. that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> So the guy who, who did this graphic is a graphic designer and she's my neighbor. So yeah. Okay. So I love yeah. that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean in the double recordings you can't see it now on this picture yes. because they have two uh right. So the, the O so is on the other side there, right? Yeah. So that's so, the O. Yeah, yeah, ah. right, right. So it makes conversation at the end. So that's yeah. Very cool. That and was so the I, challenge. I guess knowing that, um, that kind of puts a limit, right? Like, you know, there, there's going to be 12 recordings. Yeah. Um, yeah. So when you're thinking about styles, and like you said, you don't want to be repetitive. Um, yeah. You want to have different ideas. Um, does that kind of, I mean, I say constraint, but like limiting yourself to know, like, this is a project, we're going to have 12 pieces to it. Um, does that change like your thinking of like, of, of, of what you want to include in it and when? Um, or is it is it more just kind of uh, free flowing, like you'll, find collaborators and you'll figure it out as you go i think it's more step by step i mean okay. when i 
when I went, like the first three, this was kind of uh, obvious. And then for the fourth, I, I wanted to originally have like Francois Muta, so he came over and um, the two Whistle brothers, uh, Jorge and Michael Whistle, they are really great players I met back in Cuba and they live in Madrid. And um, <clears throat> when I when we fixed the recording session um, one day before Jorge got COVID, so mm. uh, he couldn't come over. So we were just three, just uh, and mm. I originally really didn't want to make one recording with it. so specific like bass drums, sax. This is uh, felt a little dangerous <laughs> for me after <laughs> all these uh, incredible recordings with uh, Sony Rawlings and yeah, those yeah. guys. Yeah. So I. Yeah, so this one just happened like this, and uh, yeah, I mean, yeah, sometimes I I just had to adjust. How how do you like playing in that format, like a bass drum sax? Is is it something you've done um, a lot? And is there certain kind of uh, like benefits, or is it fun to play like in that small kind of trio with a sax? Uh, like yes, I really enjoy the freedom, of course, like probably all those drummers did too if you listen to elvin jones and <laughs> i mean um to be very honest i i really love the playing of uh, francois Abouta, uh, the bass player he is for this kind of a format for me a really inspiring uh, partner so most of the time when i do it i, I play with him um because he's just such a great player <laughs> and then mm. in, the, in the rhythm section uh like bass drums it's all made already so much things happening and so so much communication and uh so it's it's really fun i think but i can't i i think yeah like if it would be more straight ahead kind of stuff i don't know if it's for me the it would be the right thing for me mm -hmm. i think it, with this kind of open-minded uh communicating players it, it's really very nice and uh we do now the live kicks with in quartet with a, with a trumpet too, so it's a quartet. If you if you do the live kicks, and this is really great, I really enjoy that. Too. Very cool. Um, so now looking back, is there a letter that you like the most? Yeah, what's your favorite? <laughs> no, no, I to be honest, I like them kind of all because they all have a special story and a special vibe. I I think I'm. Well, I I'm kind of proud of the whole of the whole thing, you know. <laughs> um, it's, and it, yeah, it's beautiful. It's kind of coming. It's kind of a a, a full uh, series. So um, each each recording is a part of the series, and each recording I'm exploring some different uh, stuff and different combinations and different compositions. So, but what I'm really happy actually, I start now to to also mix up a little bit the the different uh, um, musicians. So now I'm going on the road with uh, Greg Osby and Arno Kreicher, who is the Hammond player of the of the number nine. But we also do two gigs with uh, François Mouta, who plays the bass on number four, and uh, João Baradas, the accordion player, who plays on number five. So <laughs> it starts Very to be cool. kind of a, a scene a little scene of musicians who are inter interested in communicating and open for like adventurous music. And I think going a step further, this is uh, the thing I think which I like the most about the series that mm -hmm. uh, I, I, um, I ha I'm having kind of a, a scene of musicians around me who know how I work, who like to work with me and who are open to exchange and to collaborate with other uh, musicians who have the same approach to music. So I think yep. this is for me a really exciting thing. Um, we'll, we'll also link to your website where you can get information on your gigs. Um, so it looks like there's a couple here in Germany. That yeah, you'll be... I have to update this list. Yes. <laughs> so we'll, we'll we'll also drop a link to this in the description if you if you want to go check them out. Um, and uh, so you mentioned that you have about a dozen gigs coming up. Is it are they all in Germany or are they in a few different? Uh, no, states? we start in Poland and then I can up, I will update that today. Okay. They right. start in Poland, 
Uh, then we go through Holland, uh, then Germany, Prague, and we end up in Italy. So, cool. Yeah, it's kind of a round trip a little. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah. distances yeah. are still small in Europe. But yeah, we encourage everybody to go check you out if um, if you're in the area. Um, that would be great. Yeah. I mean, um, also the communication button on Bandcamp ends up with me. So whoever wants to get in touch. Or I'm okay. also on Facebook yeah. and so always happy to exchange and to, to communicate. Yeah. I did want to ask, um, so for conversations, it, it is pressed on LP. Um, you know, a lot of us really love record collecting. Um, what was the process of pressing? Um, I'm sure there were like challenges just in terms of getting time on the press, uh, especially during COVID. It seemed like that all the presses were backed up. Um, you know, they just mm -hmm. couldn't. They couldn't put enough vinyl out for everybody but um you know you mentioned before that you're an analog guy um but what can you tell us a little bit about the the process um for you know the lp pressing and uh yeah any anything yeah. around that and and you also have your own studio right yes i think i can maybe tell more about <laughs> this i mean i have to say i'm a uh, i have a very small team for all the work um, and we, we share some of the work, but I'm not hooked up with a big booking agency or a big label. And on the on one way, this gives a lot of freedom to me because I can just show up with, with this idea and just realize it, uh, which is great. And on the other side, I also have to uh, sometimes just trust people uh, for, for um, how can I say, or just just let them do whatever they feel is it's yeah. best and just trust them. <laughs> yeah. And uh, this is, uh, I mean, my my studio is basically just a big room. It has 80 square meters and it, it's high, I think 3.5 meters. And I have a very good uh, Steinway piano there. And uh, oh, nice. I started like quite a bit of years ago with a, my sound engineer to improve it acoustically. So right now it's really good. It's kind of a working um, studio and uh, this engineer, he has his gear there. So I really can record uh, quick and cheap, but with a, just a good quality. So I'm happy about that. That's fantastic. And um, yeah, it's, it's really great. I'm really happy about it. Um, and with the pressing, I just found um, a guy in, in Austria, just on the Swiss border, who basically was really into quality um, and also into communicating with me in a in a really direct and good way. And um, I must admit, once I was setting up the all the the um, the process of pressing, I just left it to him basically mm -hmm. um, because okay. I thought he is the he is the guy who knows how to do it best and in, in which way he has to do it. So <laughs> I um, I mean, we we did some digital files and I know in the in the vinyl community, sometimes this is kind of a uh, thing that people want to do this direct press yeah. or direct. Um, but I mean, some of my music is complex and uh, some of my, especially the last, uh, uh conversation it has some different layers and if they are not really balanced in a good way it's just not fun to listen to so i yeah. thought it's it's more important for me to to really uh, invest time in in the mixing process and the editing and mastering process and then to have a really good file and then press it on vinyl i prefer that for this music to to just the the possibility on just the two track uh, press and to press it directly on vinyl so yeah yeah but that's basically just the way i chose um but i'm sorry i can't say much more <laughs> okay, no about sorry. the the pressing process um i'm really interested in, in your studio i feel like that's such a uh, extension of your like art because it's a space for you to be able to play and record and bring people in is that did, when you collaborated with ron carter recently did he fly over or did you where did you guys work together actually um 
No, this is a different story. Um, okay. uh, I mean, Ron, he came over to Switzerland for a. Um, first of all, he got some some. Uh, how can I say? Uh, in the at the Burghausen Jazz Festival. I don't know if this is known in the states, but it's in Germany, South Germany, one of the oldest, uh, biggest festivals, and also one of the festivals which is still connected to, to. Um, Different businesses, so so uh, there are really big uh, enterprises taking care of flight costs and, and fees and stuff. So so they really can afford uh, a big program and they can fly over work hard with his three or first class and they really can afford that. So basically, he was there for for a big concert and uh, I think he received kind of a uh, in honor yeah. of his life achievement something. And uh, after that, he came to Lucerne, the city where my my brother is um, uh, the the head of the jazz department. And he he gave like a master class with a big band. They played the program and they they worked on that and they make a gig. And after that, he had the day off. And uh, so I uh, Michael just told that, me that, and he was like um, complaining, "Oh, I have to take care of Ron Carter for a day for nothing." And I just asked him if he. <laughs> I'll just ask him if we if we do a recording with him, and uh, yeah, so he agreed uh, surprisingly, <laughs> and uh, wow. we really uh, we, so we went in the studio just uh, in Lucerne, just okay. not he, because he's like eighty four yeah. or eighty five, yeah. so yeah, we didn't want to bring him one and a half hours uh, traveling mm. to Basel and and to a, a funky studio in the basement, you know. <laughs> so we thought it's better <laughs> to have him in a in a re real fancy place you know uh yeah but i mean it was an amazing experience we worked through like four and a half hours without break and he was really a oh. yeah you modest humble the most modest humble person i ever met musically when you when yeah. you meet like a, a musician like ron for the first time um in terms of uh, uh deciding what songs to do is, is it are, are you kind of familiar with his repertoire and will kind of adapt to things that you think he may know, or do you kind of work together to figure out exactly what you want to do? What's that decision making look like? Um, I think it's something we really take advantage from the from the work we did with uh, some other like high level guests like Dave Liebman or also with Greg Osby. Uh, I think that the, the thing is to find this small border where you where they still feel comfortable with what they do and also respected with their history, which is so big, but also feel challenged by something which they usually don't do. <laughs> because mm -hmm. I mean, especially Ron Carter, I mean, he, he played on over 2000 records. So why shouldn't he play another time all blues or stuff like this? So I think he, those guys, they can be bored very quickly if you don't challenge them in a good way. So. We wrote some music just, uh, just, uh, and also in some of the music, we weren't sure if he really will take it or if he will <laughs> really uh, reject it and say that's not for me. <laughs> but he was really open to anything. So, okay. yeah, we, we only recorded the uh, originals. Okay. And we just did at the end one standard. Um, Which yeah. one? So Which one did you do? We did uh, All the Things You Are. Okay. Which cool. was great. Yeah. And on the way, yes, I mean, then you sit there and then you hear, hear those lines he played with Miles and then it's just a great moment, of course, because it's mm -hmm. just unbelievable to, to hear this kind of vibe in your own music. I mean, what can you wish more than that? But then yeah. on the other hand, you also feel that he leaves this path and, and also explores some stuff together with your playing, which is great too, I think, or even more important for a, for a good recording. and. I think it also maybe uh, splits uh, th those really curious minds to others, which are maybe more in their own thing and and not so open to to other influences. And I think I mean Ron Carter was definitely one of he was totally in the moment and totally trying to to add something to the music, which is relevant, which is. That was a great moment for us, mm. I must say.
I'm just going to say that this project, that conversation project, project really appeals to people like me and Mike, because we just love these large sets of, you know, oh, yeah. connected, we do. connected things. Like um, the, there's a, a series called Wildflowers. It was recorded in the 70s. It's like this free jazz mm -hmm. uh, recorded in New York. And we've gotten those recently. And we're like, sweet. We got five records. They're all connected together. Yeah. We're gonna, yeah. You know, we're going we're gonna to experience this this thing as a whole, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. So your that that 12, you know, 12 conversation project is really attractive to us. Because That's of great. that kind of experience. You know? I mean, it's uh, funny in the chess world, not so many of those. I mean... It's more kind of the uh, thing that you just go to the studio, record, and then you get the fuck out of there. <laughs> That's right, exactly. So exactly. Uh, I think uh, it's also a very nice challenge to yeah. to have a big bigger picture of the whole thing and not only yeah. just go in and play and then out. Yeah. And I'm sure. I mean, I'm yeah. putting myself in your 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 sh uh, shoes, but I feel like it's exciting to think about, like knowing that you have these future projects and just always having that and always kind of thinking mm -hmm. about where, where you want to go. Mm -hmm. That sounds mm -hmm. fun. Like that sounds like it's a, uh, you know, it's a, like you mentioned, it's a larger project and we mm -hmm. need to complete it. It's not just mm -hmm. going to the studio and getting the fuck out. It's, it's, we mm -hmm. gotta, I have to think about how this comes, how we finish this and how we mm -hmm. do it in a way that, mm -hmm. you know, is, uh, is exciting for me. And I'm, mm -hmm. I feel like just the, the idea of that, but yeah, Chris and I, we mm -hmm. like, like, like volumes of things. So like if there's mm -hmm. like, a set of like the uh, the Shelly Man at the Black Hawk. There's four of those. So, mm -hmm. like, yeah. So, there's a there's a bunch. It's fun to collect those. Yeah, yeah. Block yeah. Nickel, yeah. It's one of yeah. my favorites with my Davies. Yeah. It's, yeah. There's yeah. Yeah. I mean it's it's I always like also in the classical music, I liked kind of these big symphonies, uh, which mm. which you you go through so many states of mind uh, and which go on for for an hour or even more and it's kind of a uh, yeah you can explore so many uh, regions in your soul or also musically which which you you couldn't explore otherwise because you always there are things which have to be said first <laughs> kind of. and yeah. uh, you never go to this point where you where you see oh what's now oh where should i go now and I, I really like that. Yeah. Do you have a release date and a title for the record? The oh, okay, yeah. For which record do you mean? The the, the Ron Carter. Oh uh, no. Um I mean it's we will start mixing now and um yeah, probably I guess around late September, October. Mm -hmm. I think we will we will release that. But uh I also have to think over if I should just release it on my own label, which I think mm -hmm. I will. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> I just didn't have the time yet to to think it all over. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But uh, I mean, like mixing wise, it's piano trio. It's easy. I mean, yeah. it's like uh, yeah. quick work and no editing. So. <laughs> So we could release it right away, but I, I mean, I'm so busy now with, with touring and the whole uh, conversation stuff. So I don't really want to to uh, overrule that now <laughs> with the wrong card. So yeah, I think well, probably autumn it will be out. Okay, okay. Awesome. We'll keep an eye out for it. Absolutely. Great, yeah. Nice, very nice. Thank you so much for coming and talking with us. This is always a thrill to talk with artists. Um, it gives us a different perspective and we get kind of a, you know, to learn a little bit about the process, which kind of enriches our listening experience and just being able to, um, you know, experience the music. So thank you so much for coming. Um, Chris Felipe, thank do you have you any, so much. any final thoughts? Yeah, just, just thank you for, for joining. And I want to echo what Mike said. It really does enrich our, uh, you know, our connection to the music to be able to talk to folks such as yourself. So thank you all. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. It was a pleasure, really. Very nice. Thank, thank you for joining us for the I think it was a great moment because the conversation is wrapped up. We got it here at, at the very end. And I think that's how I, I got in contact with your music initially by following your conversations. Great. I think in some many Facebook groups that you were showing it mm -hmm. and uh, that, that, that's mm -hmm. how I thought about. And and most important, yes, talking to us. From a listener's perspective, you know, uh, it's always it's always great and enriches. I think it, it was a great contribution. We we deeply deeply thank you.
for joining us today. Thank you so much. It was a big pleasure. Please, please come back whenever you have new projects to talk about, or if you just want to catch up, um, you're welcome here anytime. Um, Great. Thank you. And uh, for everyone watching, uh, please uh, leave a comment. Let us know what you thought about this. Um, check out conversations. Let us know what you think about that. Uh, please share the video um, and uh, you know, like and subscribe and all that stuff. Really appreciate that. And we'll see you guys next time. Yeah. Thanks, everyone. Thank Great. Thank Take care. Thank